Hello, everyone, and welcome to this week's episode of Leadnap Gaming. It's been an interesting week that's seen quite a bit of activity on the reaction video front. I'll start off by saying I'm not generally a large fan of reaction videos, because they require you to make assumptions about what the original person understands, thinks, knows, and believes. And you know what they say about assumptions. In gearing up to revisit my fleet planning series from last year, I had sought to begin our journey with exploration fleets. And last week, I put out a video pointing out some issues coming up with one. That video was picked up by Sailed Mike, who did a reaction video to it, in which plenty was left to be clarified. I'm not usually in the practice of belting out responses, but I do feel that my video may not have been as well explained as what I wanted to do so. so I will spend a little time today rehashing some of those points, while also addressing a theme we'll see play out with another content creator blowing up the channels this week. I'll start with this. I disagree with the statement that theory crafting was acceptable in 2014, but is no longer acceptable in 2022 when done by creators who don't run a podcast. I agree that theory crafting is a slippery slope that can easily lead to people believing that the persistent universe will be something it won't. However, players in 2022 still theorycraft heavily when deciding which ships to buy. A practice reinforced by CIG's own marketing products, which are designed to elicit such practice to entice buyers to spend big. I have always championed a smart and cautious approach to spending money, which is what the fleet planning series is all about in the first place. I realize that Salty Mike may not experience this, but I get tons of emails, comments, and lively Discord discussion on which ships to buy, which are the best for any given reason, so on and so forth. It is far easier and more logical to publish videos explaining the thought process applied, teaching backers how to fish as it were, rather than constantly write the same email over and over explaining why the Carrick isn't the godship. It is part of that process, then, that I often journey down common theories to explain rational roots back to reality. I, too, have followed the development since the early days. I just didn't make content about it. At the same time, CIG both encourages and requires theory crafting in the marketing materials, as I already mentioned, but also in the very nature by which they have failed to concretely define, or better yet, implement playable game loops, ship functions, or ideas while simultaneously abandoning fixed positions they had about how something was going to be for something entirely different. Star Citizen is not slated at this point to be the same game it was in 2014. Updating those beliefs is essential to avoiding beliefs about a verse that won't be. Enough on that, let's talk about exploration issues. I am solidly in favor of siloed exploration ships, and ships in general, I do, however, see some strong issues when it comes to this on the development side. To begin with, as I went into last week, the problem is always logistics. Plenty of space games avoid this issue by not modeling them. It's one of my favorite elements of CIG's flagship product that these things are modeled and are considerations we have to account for. It is fantastic that we must make choices that determine the outcome of our endeavors, such as how we outfit our ships. The issue then is one that CIG falls back on traditional game balance techniques where doing so makes no sense. Frankly, and I don't say this because I own one, the Carrick should do it all. Same to the Odyssey, Polaris, Endeavor, Idris, Kraken, even the 890 Jump. As a proud owner and regular champion of a 315, if its capabilities are no different than that of the larger ships and it has the same effective range to reach every part of the verse, there's no reason, for lore or gameplay, to build a larger ship. Generally speaking, the rationale is always that there are two routes to the same goal. You could gather a bunch of smaller ships with either single pilots or small crews and achieve the logistical balance required to have a successful mission. Alternatively, you could take the same manpower and utilize a single ship to achieve the same outcome. The large exploration ships should be able to reach distant places smaller ships cannot pushing players to crew larger, more capable ships. If small jump points mitigate this, the advantage will always lie in smaller single-seat craft, a point we'll see again later. It is my opinion that most players discount the impact of crew. There are a ton of players who solo their characters out into the verse. There are a hundred-player orgs who own 
three Idrises and a Javelin. Any regular viewer of my channel is aware that I have constantly stood on my soapbox of imagination versus reality when it comes to the crew requirements of larger ships. It's also why, for example, last week I gave an estimate of a skeleton crew of three to the Carrick, and two with a possibility to solo a Starfarer. Not because I don't know how to count crew stations or what the material says, and not because I don't recognize the power of a fully crewed ship. Again, a topic we'll see later. Rather, because experience shows the vast majority of ships after release will be crewed this way. When it comes to exploration, regardless of how the mechanic plays out, the silo issue remains. If the equipment to refine quantum fuel can fit on the Dur, and Origin can fix hydrogen scoop technology to their single-seat craft, there's no reason the same equipment cannot be fitted to larger vessels capable of adding a crew station to man the equipment, costing them food and life support space to maintain, especially if these craft are marketed, in lore or reality, as long-range and long-endurance vessels. Conversely, if subcapital and larger vessels are unable to break from their silos, CIG must provide us logistical support craft equally capable of range and endurance. Time is the game killer. We always think about distance relative to the small stant system we have, because it is what we have, and no. That said, if we are really to return to long queue times, great distances between jump points of all sizes, all of which to create that frontier that explorers can treasure hunt, the issue will remain that few people will want to spend even a day traveling and finding the area of a planet that something is on, only to then have to fly back to their home base, change ships to the ship capable of doing the exploration technique required to exploit that treasure and go all the way back. That means then that both ships would have to venture out together, which can be a problem if one lacks the range or ability to use the same jump points. Sure, the argument will always exist that the location data could be sold, meaning you don't have to exploit it yourself or you could buy it off someone else but the largest profits are in discovery and self-exploitation. The vast majority of players can be depended on to do so, because at the end of the day, it is a video game, sold to the masses looking to experience the best life the verse has to offer. After all, every player has a ship in a universe of NPCs who don't. There will certainly be a handful of players who are willing to work for minimum wage and roleplay out a poor existence in the verse working as some factory technician. That said, most players will have millions of UEC in their bank accounts and sit on a hangar with multiple large and expensive ships. Long-time backers, the people who make arguments like, you're not buying a ship, you're backing development, and it's a simulation, not a video game, are going to be left disappointed. CIG is a for-profit business, developing a video game intended to cater to the masses and suck up the lion's share of space video gamers. Games like Escape from Tarkov, Dark Souls, and so forth are niche games with small, dedicated fan bases who thrive on the hardcore bravado of playing a game that's generally regarded as a miserable experience unless you get good. There's a reason Call of Duty has more players and makes more money. The Persistent Universe is a game built around 3 million players and by market dynamics alone, one that will favor maintaining the largest possible player base and positive game experience. I cannot stand backers, content creators especially, who champion the idea that if a large number of casual or new players don't like something about the game, they should just quit. Without those new backers and their excitement, CIG would have closed doors a long time ago. CIG has shifted from marketing the original game to the game they're building today, promoting backers the chance to use their voice to determine game feature implementation there is no grade applied to the duration of which someone has backed the game. Which takes us to the other content creator drama of the week, the A2 and Morphologist. Marcus Wynn did a fantastic job of picking apart the tirade Morph made on an A2's failed bombing attempt on JT during an apparent livestream of his. There is no reason for me to rehash his points. If you haven't seen the video, there is a link in the description below for you to go and check it out. Marcus deserves the credit here. I do want to spend a moment, though, to talk about this in relation to the topic we've spent this episode so far on, crew, ship design and capability, and the gameplay around it. I will counter Marcus's point that a hammerhead can roll face on the A2. 
This isn't to suggest that his experience of regularly doing so is wrong in some way, because it isn't, but because crew is at the end of the day, the factor. A partially crewed, properly outfitted A2 can and will wreck a fully crewed hammerhead without wincing. There's video of me doing so in my 2952 cinematic from the new year. In Star Citizen, as well as life, the quality of crew will always be a factor, as well as proper utilization of technique. The A2 is superior to the hammerhead in that it can concentrate its firepower more effectively in one place, while minimizing its profile simultaneously. It has heavier armor, better shields. It's designed to survive heavy punishment while reaching the release point to deliver its primary payload and fulfill its intended purpose on the battlefield. That costs the A2 a lot that the hammerhead doesn't have to pay. The hammerhead is capable of projecting the majority of its firepower in almost every direction, while the A2 can only concentrate that firepower in a small area. More importantly, however, the success of the hammerhead is rationally connected to having it fully crewed, which is not true when it comes to the A2. Marcus isn't wrong because the majority of A2s are soloed. Players intending to utilize the bombing capabilities of the A2 recognize the pilot's chair is the only station required and thus are unlikely to man their own defensive systems, relying on their ability to tank the damage output of the defenses long enough to deliver their salt mine. Marcus is still correct when it comes to even a fully crewed A2 for two reasons. First, if you add a second ship, potentially a single seat fighter or even something that's sending torpedoes, you can easily exploit the A2's inability to defend itself from any quarter. To shoot down or evade a torpedo, it must expose itself to the hammerhead's onslaught. At the same time, even the hammerhead alone creates defense in depth. Engaging the A2 even 30 kilometers out buys time for additional defenders to join the fray, and for those in the target area to execute their react-to-air attack drill and disperse from the kill zone. If the A2 ignores the defenses and barrels in, that single hammerhead will make quick work of it if the gunners don't make fools of themselves, failing to hit their pips. Just like the Carrick wouldn't be OP in doing it all, the A2 in this case is fulfilling its intended ability. The expectation that a ship intended to fight through heavy defenses should be downed by a single AAA emplacement is laughable, especially when the counter to the monster firepower the A2 can deliver is simply move. Every one of us has felt the pain of being punished by a single player because we failed to have appropriate situational awareness. I applaud Morph's ability to put together huge groups to play through events, but with a party the fraction of the size of his, I've enjoyed exploiting JT while putting LPOPs far enough out that everyone can man their ships and crush whatever comes their way no matter the size. His complaints about players potentially exploiting the A2's single gameplay to achieve disrupting JT followed up with the suggestion of making a 120-person party so that the entire server pop is in your group and thus can utilize JT unhindered is an even more egregious exploitation. The JT event is intended to bring players in looking to disrupt the party. It's why when additional drug labs were added back in the day, the JT throwdown ended before it was even removed. We should be excited people are trying to bring their A2 to ruin the party. It gives us the gameplay we're constantly clamoring that CIG hasn't given us enough of. I'm leaving it there for this episode. Again, we're only a few hundred subs away from that odyssey, ending up in someone's hangar during IAE. Make sure to comment and subscribe if you haven't, if you want an opportunity to be the owner of the hangar it ends up in. Do also make it a point to check out both Salty Mike and Marcus Wynn's channels, as multiple perspectives will always be a benefit to you as you make your way through the verse and its development. Thank you for watching, supporting the channel, and being a fantastic audience I love seeing in the verse. I'll catch you all next time.